by an old picture in a silver frame on my grandmother's parlor table. The picture was of a Civil War soldier, no older than my brother's. He was wearing a Union uniform with brass buttons down the front and an ill-fitting cap and a musket at his side. He looked all at once determined to be brave and scared to death. His eyes stared straight forward with this look that said, what's to become of me? My grandmother told me that the soldier in the picture was her mother's brother and that he was killed by a stray bullet in the Civil War. The haunting look of that young soldier's face, it's stayed with me all my life. Like many Americans, I have ancestors on both sides of the war. My mother was from Nebraska, my father from Alabama, and my dad grew up on an Alabama farm that had been in his family for generations. So, there were many old stories about the war, including one about a family member who hid up in a tree while Union troops just passed beneath, and then another about a neighbor who was hung by his thumbs by Union troops sent there to tear up the railroad seems he wouldn't tell them where he had buried his silver. And then, I found a diary that my great-great-uncle had kept in Alabama during the Civil War. And as I read the diary, I, I could feel the warm breath of his life and times on every page. And I began to search for true stories of the war left behind by other Americans as well. I found the letters of Theo and Harriet Perry. I left my pregnant wife and child in Marshall, Texas to fight for the South. We wrote to each other devotedly throughout the war. This is our true story, and these are our words. I discovered a book written by a freed slave named Elizabeth Keckley in a New York Museum shop. I was born a slave. Therefore, I came upon this earth free in thought, but fettered in action. This is my true story, and these are my words. A friend told me about the inspiring memoirs of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I was a college professor in Maine before the war broke out. I enlisted and fought for the Union. I soon found myself at the center of the most important battle ever fought in North America. This is my true story, and these are my words. But it was my uncle's diary that really inspired my quest. <laughs> so my name is Joseph Harris. Cotton planter from Oak Barry, Alabama. It is November 9th, 1860. This is my true story, and these are my words. This is my true story, and these are my words. This is my true story, and these are my words. This, this is our true story, and, and these, these are our words. words. And these are our words. I heard today Abraham Lincoln was elected president. <laughs> well, this is ominous news, as he is bitterly opposed to our southern institutions. I went to a mass meeting for the purpose of taking into consideration the secession of Alabama from the Union in consequence to Lincoln's election. Oh, this is a dangerous business. Never heard so much confusion as I heard that. Passions are riding so high, everyone wanted to speak at once. The North will fight. We must defend our I perceive that we are on the eve of one of the greatest revolutions imaginable. We are a band of brothers and native to the soil. Fight for our property, we gain by honest toil. And when our rights were threatened, a cry rose near and far. Hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, 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 hurrah for southern rights. Hurrah, hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. As long as the Union was faithful to her trust, like friends and brethren, kind were we and just. But now the northern treachery attempts a right to mark. Hurrah, 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 hurrah
must defend our sacred honor from this Yankee insult. The South will be victorious. Secession! Come on, let's get it. Oh, my God. Hey. I fear we may be moving too quickly. Now, these people are my friends. They are good people, but they seem so sure that war is the answer. Now, why can't I be so sure? What if my friends are wrong? They could be killed. I could be killed. Our way of life could be destroyed. There must be some way to avoid war. I love the South, and I fear for her future. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times then are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. I was born in early on one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray, hooray, in Dixieland I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie. Away, away, away down south in Dixie. Away. Southerners at the time, including my uncle, were very religious. They engaged in a great deal of moral self-examination on a variety of topics, but not slavery. Listen carefully to the words of Bonnie Blue Flag. <clears throat> we are a band of brothers and native to the soil. Fighting for our property, we gain by honest war. Say your goodbyes. You're never coming back here again. The announcement fell on that roof de law cabin like a thunderbolt. I remember how my father cried out against the cruel separation. His last kiss, his wild straining to hold my mother, the tears and the goodbyes. And then he was gone. My mother could not restrain her sorrow. My old mistress had no tolerance for her tears. Stop the nonsense! There's no necessity for putting on airs. There's plenty more men around here, and if you want a husband so badly, stop your crying and go back home! 
Mother turned away in stoic silence. My parents never met again in this world. A long way from Texas 
volunteered for service, but he deeply longed for home. Dear Harry, I send these lines in hopes that you and our darling daughter, Sugar Lumpy, are well. I'm in camp near Shreveport and all so far has been quiet. I was sent into Shreveport yesterday evening to scour the town out and carry missing soldiers back into camp. I got a long string of them before I was done. I had to go some places a gentleman ought not be seen and take them out of the presence of their <clears throat> amours. <laughs> the humblest home in the Confederacy is preferred to the life of a soldier in camps. There is an odor about camps that is sickening. I do not care how nasty they are kept, they will smell badly. And anything that is cooked tastes like a camp smell. It is sort of a, a disagreeable kitchen smell that I cannot describe. My dear, one scant look at you would fill me with unusual bliss. I never knew how much my life is wrapped up in you and daughter as I now know. All the world is a blank in sadness unless your face shines upon it. With you, I would be happy on bread and water. Without you, wealth, fame, and glory would be worthless, and indeed, misery. May God grant us to all meet again. Your husband, Theo. My own sweet husband, your letters are almost the only source of joy and comfort I have. I read and reread them. But for them and sugar lumpy, life would be a blank to my heart. Sometimes for days I have the most oppressive feelings. I feel there is a weight of thousands of tons upon my heart. Oh, husband, I feel as if I should die here all alone. Oh, if I could see you. Sugar lumpy and I send you a thousand kisses apiece. I am mad with myself that I did not kiss you a hundred times more when you were here. Well, I'll make it up to you if I ever see you again. Love, Harriet. As the blackbird in the spring beneath the willow tree, sad and pant, I heard you sing the praise of Aurelie. Swallows in the air. 
question. Finally, I summoned the courage. Master, I propose to buy myself and my son. Oh. Well, you have served my family faithfully. You deserve your freedom. I will take $1,200 for you and your son. <laughs> Joyous news! <laughs> but how was I going to raise $1,200? A kind patron said to me. Lizzie, you have many friends in St. Louis. I am going to raise the $1,200 required to buy your freedom. <laughs> <laughs> She did as she promised. The twelve hundred dollars was raised, and at last, my son and I were free. <laughs> free, free! <laughs> but a glorious ring to the world. The very stars sing the same with joy. Free by the laws of man and the smile of God, and heaven bless them who made it so. Governor, I feel an overwhelming sense of duty. 
Fort Sumter has been attacked. The flag of our nation insulted. The honor and authority of the Union defied. The southern states must remain in the Union. How do you feel about slavery? I am sympathetic to the plight of the slaves. But I am no abolitionist. The point is, the southern states must not secede. The Union must be saved. Professor Chamberlain, let me be frank. Um, I have been told by some that you are not a fighter. One of your so-called friends even advised me that as a soldier, you will amount to nothing at all. But you have passion, Chamberlain, and you are brilliant. Therefore, I offer you a commission as colonel in the 20th Maine Infantry. Yeah, thank you, Governor. But I would prefer to start as a lieutenant colonel. Before I lead an infantry unit, I want to learn the business first. <laughs> well, Godspeed and good luck, Chamberlain. You're, uh, you're going to need. The rebels are going to be a lot tougher than people think. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more from Mississippi's winding stream and from New England shore. We leave our plows and workshops, our wives and children dear, with hearts too full for utterance, but but a silent tear. We dare not look behind us, but steadfastly before. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. We are coming, we are coming, our union to restore. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. Look up all our valleys where the growing harvest shines. You may see our sturdy farmer boys fast forming into lines. And children from their mother's knee are pulling from the weeds. And learning how to reap and sow against their country's needs. And a farewell group stands weeping at every cottage door. We are coming, Father Abraham.
Davises had moved south and Elizabeth Keckley had a problem. She needed to find a new employer. Now, it would be hard to top the prestige of working for the Davises, but this was one determined and ambitious woman. A patron told me that Mrs. Lincoln was looking for a personal dressmaker and assistant at the White House and arranged an interview for me. You are Lizzie Keckley, I believe, the dressmaker that was recommended to me. Who else have you worked for in the city? Uh, Mrs. Jefferson Davis has been one of my best patrons. Oh, Mrs. Davis, well, so you have worked for her, have you? Uh, of course, you gave satisfaction. So far, so good. Uh, can you do my work? As you can tell, I am much slimmer than Mrs. Jefferson Davis. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes. Uh, will there be much work for me to do? Well, that, Mrs. Peckman, will depend entirely upon your price. I cannot afford to be extravagant. We are just from the West and are poor. If you do not charge too much, I will be able to give you all my work. Oh, I'm sure you will find that my prices are reasonable. Imagine, this woman was once a slave, and now she was working in the White House. And not only that, she soon became Mrs. Lincoln's closest friend. It seems that she was the only other person besides Abraham Lincoln himself who understood her peculiar temperament. Lizbeth! And sharp tongue. Lizbeth, my husband is too trusting of other people. I've tried to tell him he is surrounded by charlatans and humbugs, but he won't listen to me. Father, you are president of the United States, and we are at war. I am giving you excellent, free advice. Why won't you heed it? Why, Mother, if I listen to you, I would soon be without a cabinet and army generals. Suppose we give you control of the government and command of the armies. Would that satisfy you? Yes, it would. <laughs> Mr. Lincoln was far from handsome. <laughs> Well, he was not admired for his good looks, but for the nobility of his soul and the greatness of his heart. <laughs> I observe him to be wholly unselfish in every respect. He doted on his two boys, Tad and Willie. They were his relief from the horrors of the war, which weighed on him greatly as each new day brought rolls and rolls of fresh new graves on the battlefield. In Alabama, Joe Harris began to feel pangs of guilt, even though he had his doubts about the war. By the summer of 1862, many of my friends had enlisted in the Confederate Army. I began to feel that I should join. My wife disagreed. Joe! You have a wife and a family to take care of. Besides, who's going to run this plantation when you've gone off the wall? The South has plenty of men who wanted this war. Let them go fight. Woo! Nonetheless, I decided to join up when my wife was out of town. And when she came back and heard about what I had done, well, I wished I'd already been sent to the front lines. After weeks of drilling and all that, I bade my wife and family goodbye and joined up with the rest of my company near Columbus, Mississippi. <laughs> I wrote a little bit of home to my wife. I even did my first cooking by a campfire. Oh, no. Well, I, I guess if I get really desperate, I can always do like some of the other boys and just eat peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting by the roadside on a summer's day Chatting with my messmates, passing time away Lying beneath the shadows underneath the trees Goodness, how delicious! Eating goober peas Peas, 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 eating goober peas Goodness, how delicious! Eating goober peas Their loudest, Mr. Hare's your mule. But another custom enchanter than these is wearing out your grounders. 
Starling V. Belcher returned home to Alabama and was the big winner in a poker game. Unfortunately, somebody followed him home, killed him, and took the money. He survived the war, but not the poker game. Such are the vagaries of life. Meanwhile, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain accepted his officer's commission and reported for duty in Virginia. In December of 1862, the glorious Union Army of the Potomac had yet to find the right general to lead it to victory against the rebels. President Lincoln decided to give Ambrose Burnside a try. Burnside immediately declared himself unfit for the job. Someone should have taken the man at his word. Burnside proposed to attack Lee's entrenched army at Fredericksburg, Virginia, in a frontal assault across a river using pontoons. Lee perfectly discerned what Burnside was doing and placed his men and guns at the ready across the river. General Hunt. How is our artillery fixed to withstand a Union attack? General Lee, a chicken could not live on that field when we open on it. Eventually, Burnside's pontoon bridges were laid without opposition. Lee knew his guns would do better work when crowds of Union troops were crossing. My division was held in reserve when the charge began. We stood for an hour, witnessing an immortal, futile charge, and then another. And another, and another, and yet another. Finally, our turn came. Our crowding, swerving columns set the pontoons swaying. Horses reared, and men could scarcely keep their balance. The rebel artillery created havoc. Crushed bodies, severed limbs, were everywhere around. On we pushed, up slopes slippery with blood. We exchanged fierce volleys, and then a red sunset appeared, and all was dark. It was a bitterly cold night. Necessity compelled strange uses. For myself, it seemed best to bestow myself between two dead men. Among the many left here from earlier assaults, and draw a third crosswise for a pillow, pulling the flap of his coat over my face to fend off the chilling wind. And still even more chilling, 
the deep, many voiced moans that all spread the field. It was heart wrenching. It could not be borne. I rose at midnight and I followed the deep sound to where the heaviest fighting had been. As I advanced that stricken field, the grave, conglomerate, monotone resolved itself into it several diverse human elements, some breathing inarticulate agony, some calling for the mother, some begging for water, some in a prayer for life, and some for quick death. Sign from heaven that their independence was at hand, and General Lee, normally reserved, turned joyous. Oh, he was jubilant, <laughs> almost off balance, and completely desirous of embracing everyone who called on him. <laughs> oh, yeah, right over here. President Lincoln, looking at that same night sky, saw a very different sign. Only those who saw the man in privacy could tell how much he suffered. His footstep was slow and heavy, and his face sad. Like a tired child, he threw himself upon a sofa and shielded his eyes with his hands. Any news, Father? There is plenty of news, but no good news. It's dark. Dark everywhere. Mail call! Dear Theo, I have wonderful news. You have a son! A healthy baby boy! <laughs> Theo Jr. <laughs> oh, he is the best boy you ever saw. He sleeps all day and all night, and Sugar Lumpy is delighted with her little brother. We have to carry him from the bed. She begs to kiss him and nurse him all the time. <laughs> oh, I hope to see you at home once more today. Home is not home without you. Dear Harriet, it has been nearly six months since I saw you. My life has been miserable on account of our separation. I long to be with you and our children. <laughs> I often find myself transported in my imagination to our home in Texas and embracing in my arms all my little family at once. <laughs> but uh, especially embracing you, my dear. There's a yellow rose in Texas that I am going to see. 
nobody else could miss her, not half as much as me. She cried so when I left her, it like to broke my heart. And if I ever find her, we never more will part. She's seen his little rose bud on that Texas Everdale. Her eyes are bright as diamonds, they sparkle like the dew. You may talk about your claiming time and sing of Rosalie, but the yellow rose of Texas is the only girl for me. I'm telling you, she is the one. When the Rio Grande is flowing, the starry skies are bright. She walks along the river in the quiet summer night. I know that she remembers when we parted long ago. I promise to return again and not to leave her so. She's the sweetest little rosebud that Texas ever knew. Her eyes are bright as diamonds, they sparkle like the dew. You may talk about your clementine or sing a rosary, but the yellow rose of Texas. George. 
my baby boy. He died on the battlefield in Missouri, fighting proudly for the Union. He gave his life fighting for the freedom of my people. I was so proud. But suddenly, I was all alone in this world. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
outnumbered us. Our two lines met in mortal battle. The edges of the conflict swayed to and fro with wild whirlpools and eddies. And all around there was a strange mingled roar. Loud shouts of defiance, rally and desperation. And underneath a strange undertone of moans, prayers, snatches of Sabbath songs, whispers of loved names. And everywhere Men torn, broken, staggering, creeping, quivering on earth. Dead faces with strangely fixed eyes staring into the sky. Things that cannot be told, nor dreamed. But somehow, I know not how, our line held. But soon, our fire was slowing. I saw the faces of many men when they had fired their last cartridge turn anxiously towards me. Then turn square to full front again. Colonel Chamberlain, our men are nearly out of ammunition. We are surrounded by the enemy. What should we do? Fire on the land! Fire on the land! It caught like wildfire and swept along the ranks. The men fixed bayonets and charged down to the round top. The rebels were taken completely by surprise. Many in the front ranks threw down their arms and surrendered. Others turned and ran. We were taking prisoners by the score, more than we could handle. If they had challenged us, they could have marched over our bodies to victory. But we held them around top. It was a miracle. The Battle of Gettysburg was ours! <laughs> we will welcome to our numbers the loyal, true, and brave. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. And although he may be poor, Vicksburg has fallen to the enemy. I have endeavored to cheer up all that are in low spirits. Our armies are yet in the field, and they are the hopes of our young country. They may be able to overturn the pride and boast of the enemy yet. I cannot come home. All that I know of you I must learn by letter. For God's sake, write me often. My peace demands it. Your husband, Theo. You know my thoughts are always with you, darling. Theo Jr. is a promising babe and as well, but our daughter has a very bad cough and cold, so much so that she has had a fever nearly every night. I, I hope she will soon be well. We send you many kisses and embraces. Sugar Lumpy says come home and bring us some candy. <laughs> May God save you as ever on the lips of your fond and devoted Harriet. I've gone away for to stay a little while, but I'm coming back if I go ten thousand miles. Oh, who will tie your shoes and who?
but that's what Elizabeth Keckley remembered about him. She saw and remembered a sort of a private, quirky side about the Lincolns. That's what was important to her. In East Alabama, things remained relatively peaceful. Joe Harris continued to feel conflicted about the war. He wanted the South to win, but even at the height of the war, he expressed no vitriol toward the North. He seemed to dream more of peace than of victory. He was back in the Army as a sergeant in the Alabama militia. Well, I tried to raise a company of men for our militia, but few men appeared. I fear our country is, is running out of men. Great battle was raging in Georgia, north of a little railroad town called Atlanta. Several friends and I took a train to Atlanta and walked to Kennesaw Mountain, where our troops were facing General Sherman's Yankees. Now, our aim was to care for the sick and the wounded. We saw swarms of Yankees in their trenches while we waited on wounded soldiers. Bullets fell all around me. Well, it's a wonder that none struck you. I could not sleep. I drew a constant rattle of muskets and cannons. I just lay there thinking about this cool and bloody war. Oh, that we could stop this further fusion of blood. Simply have peace. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome then. Hurrah, hurrah, the men will cheer and the boys will shout, the ladies, that they will all turn out. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. The old church bell will peal with joy, hurrah, hurrah, to welcome home my darling boy, hurrah, hurrah. The village lads and lassies say with roses, they will strew the way, and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Get ready for the jubilee. destructive march from Atlanta to the sea, destroying nearly everything in his path. Many Southerners to this day think there's a special place in hell reserved for General Sherman. When I was in high school, my parents took me to visit Grant's tomb, and the tomb was surrounded by busts of Union soldiers, and I turned and saw my father in an angry stare down with the bust of General Sherman. Oh, you are damn nut. I wasn't bitter about the war, but it was the only time I ever saw him speak to an inanimate object. He just couldn't help himself. 
While Sherman was wreaking havoc in Georgia, on the other side of the Confederacy, a Union invasion force of 30,000 men had landed near Theo Perry's regiment. And even though outnumbered, it was clear that the Confederate Army must make a stand against the Union forces. Dear Harry, last night we were ordered to advance at a moment's notice. The enemy has landed 25 miles from here with thousands of mounted infantry. We will come to battle very soon. I shall fight like I was standing in the threshold of my doorway, fighting against robbers and scourgers for the defense of my wife and family. I feel very solemn. I cannot help it. It is a trying thing to join in battle, the most horrible and blasphemous thing perhaps on earth. I shall try to stay true to our cause. Kiss the children every day for me and have them kiss you for me. I love you more than my life. My love to all my family, I, I send this to them all. I may never see them again. I love my people and I die in their defense. Farewell, my dear wife. I live, I die, yours forever. My dearest husband, my love for you was never so fond or intense as in these hours of danger and trial. I am restless and uneasy. I hardly know what to do. My mind does not rest during the hours of sleep. I Despite my profound grief, 
I feel ready to give a shout of glory knowing that he died facing the enemy. He gave his life for his family and for his country. And I have faith that we'll be joined again someday in a better place. Scarecrow remnants of a once proud army fought on bravely. But the superior number of the Union's army, its ranks now swelled with tens of thousands of freed slaves, overwhelmed them after terrible losses to both sides at places like Cold Harbor, Petersburg, the Wilderness, Five Forks. General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. Slavery and freedom could not live together. Had slavery been left out of the fight, the Union would have gone down. But the enemies of the country were so misguided as to rest their cause upon it, and it was the destruction of it and of them. We did not go into the fight to strike at slavery directly. We were not thinking to solve that problem. But God, in his providence, set slavery at the forefront, and it was swept aside as with a whirlwind. Professor Chamberlain had come full circle. And when he enlisted, he was not an abolitionist. But at the end of the war, he not only considered slavery the central question of the contest, but its abolition is nothing less than the will of the Lord. I was chosen to command the parade on the occasion of the formal surrender of the arms and colors of Lee's army. The business transactions were all settled. The parole papers were all made out. I was ready for the final turn, the surrender the Army of Northern Virginia. My lines formed for the ceremony at sunrise on April 12, 1865, four years to the day from when the war had begun. Our earnest eyes scanned the Confederate troops on the opposite slopes as they broke camp and forged forward into gray columns of march with swaying battle flags. Traditionally, a surrendering army is met with haughty condescension by the victors. But I felt impelled to render some honor to bravery so high. General Chamberlain, the conquered southern troops are approaching. Should I give the command for order arms and three cheers for the Union? No, not order arms. And there is to be no cheering or celebration. Give the command for a silent salute of honor as the Confederates surrender. The salute of honor? General Chamberlain, these troops were in rebellion against us, and now they are surrendering. Yeah, and they will once again be our country. General Gordon, at the head of the Confederate columns, riding with heavy spirit and downcast face, caught the sound of shifting arms and looked up in amazement to see the silent salute of honor. Taking the meaning, he wheeled superbly on his horse, making with himself one uplifted figure and returned the salute. Then facing his command, he gave word to his successive brigades to pass the Union troops with the same position of salute. Honor, answer an honor. On our part, not a sound of trumpet more, nor roll of drums, not a single cheer, but rather stillness filled with awe and breath holding as if it were the passing of the dead. That day, 27,805 Confederate soldiers passed by and stacked their arms for the final time. Their final act was to fold their battle flags, torn, battle-worn, stained with blood. Some men knelt over the flags, pressing them to their lips with burning tears. But 
in East Alabama, word had not yet reached either side of Lee's surrender, and General Wilson's cavalry was spreading terror through the region. Our country is in an awful condition. Yankees are pulling on us in every way and in every direction. We hardly have enough men left to try to defend ourselves. Yankees finally passed through on their way to Georgia, but they missed our plantation completely. Please, please, could we just have peace? The end of the war was near at hand, and the great pulse of the loyal North thrilled with joy. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, flags were gaily being thrown into the breeze, and every city blazed with a thousand lights. For our people, it was the long-awaited time of deliverance from the bondage of slavery. Oh, we wandered about the streets of Washington, embracing each other with happy faces and hearts full of joy. <laughs> In my heart of hearts, I always knew that this day of freedom would come. Did my Lord deliver, Daniel deliver, Daniel deliver, Daniel? Did my Lord deliver, Daniel? Then why not every man?
my husband, who made a sudden, violent end. Let's try to put it out of our minds, shall we? After all, the war is over. The president and I need a distraction. We are going to attend a play tomorrow night. Ford's Theater. The next night, when I heard the news, the president had been shot. I couldn't sleep at all. Morning came at last, and what a sad morning it was. The flags that floated so gaily yesterday now were draped in black and hung in silent folds at half mast. The president was dead and the nation was mourning for him. About 11 o'clock the next morning, a messenger came to summon me to the White House. Never did I enter that solemn chamber of death with such a palpitant heart and trembling footsteps as I entered it that day. No common mortal had died. The Moses of my people had fallen in his hour of trial. When I entered the room, the members of the cabinet, as well as many distinguished officers of the army, were grouped around the body of their fallen chief. Notwithstanding the violence of the death of the president, but there was something beautiful, as well as grandly solemn, an expression of his placid face. There lived the sweetness and the gentleness of childhood, and the steely grandeur of godlike intellect. Never was a man so widely mourned. The whole world bowed his head in grief when Abraham Lincoln died. Don't we Desolation and misery have followed in their prayer. Parents have been made to rejoice by the return of their sons from the bloody field of strife. Wives and children have been made happy by the return from the field of courage, their lover and husband and father, but also. How many hearts have mourned and bled and, like Rachel of ancient days, refused to be comforted because their children were not? And sighs going up from the family hearthstone are innumerable on the count of so low upon being absent forever. Absent. I pray God that our 
our land may never see such another scourge as civil war. And people from the south and the north, as far as possible, shall forget the past and look with encouragement to the future. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed his faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Civil war was finally over. 620,000 Americans had died. Millions more were scarred, crippled, widowed, and fatherless. Whole regions of the country lay in ruins. The South was devastated. 20% of white Southern males of military age died in the Civil War. Four million enslaved people were now free. For nearly another century would pass before African Americans would begin to see the equal rights the Civil War promised. Elizabeth Keckley wrote a memoir of her White House experiences called Behind the Scenes, which brought her almost universal scorn and ridicule. America was not ready for a tell-all book about the White House written by a black woman. She died alone and nearly destitute, her only son having preceded her in death, fighting for the Union. Death haunted Harriet Perry throughout the Civil War. Besides her husband, she lost two brothers and a cousin in the fighting. Her fragile little daughter, Sugar Lumpy, also failed to survive the war. Harriet Perry died at the age of 49 in 1885. governor of Maine four times. He lived for 49 years after Appomattox, but suffered from war wounds the rest of his life. He died at the age of 85, not from old age, but from wounds he received at the Battle of Petersburg. Joe Harris lost two brothers-in-law and two cousins in the fighting, and a well-to-do man before the war, his wealth was lost when the plantation system collapsed. He went on to serve in both houses of the Alabama legislature before finally dying an old man in 1920. He is sounding forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting through the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Civil War battlefield sites have met wildly disparate fates. Little Round Top is one of the best known battle sites in America, but the site where Professor Chamberlain ministered to the dying and wounded Union soldiers in Fredericksburg, Virginia is now the parking lot of a 7-Eleven convenience store. Modern day residents of Fredericksburg shop for gas and groceries there, unaware of the blood-stained, hollowed ground beneath their feet, where dying and wounded soldiers whispered love names and cried out for their wives and their mothers. I decided that I had to find out what happened to the young soldier in the picture on my grandmother's potter table, the one whose looks who seemed to say, what's to become of me? And I learned that he was an Ohio farm boy named Alex Sawhill, the oldest of six children, and he enlisted in 1862 and was killed in the Battle of Monocacy in 1864. He was 18 years old. The Civil War that I knew was a war from history books. 
And I had looked at the war from the northern perspective and the southern perspective, from all the things which separated us and divided us, and some of which continue to divide us to this day. But when I look at the war from the human perspective, it opens my eyes. I was blind, but now I see. My Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to